Welcome to Females and Fine Fettle, from Wiped Out to Wealthy. This is where conscientious women entrepreneurs and women living like a boss come to learn about balancing their personal and professional wellness with ease. If you have the enthusiasm, motivation, and grit to make it happen, then listen up every Monday. To be sure you don't miss an episode, sign up for weekly updates at femalesandfinefettle.com. The following discussion is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease. Please don't apply any of this information without first speaking with your doctor. Now, here are your hosts, Denise Pasquinelli and Dr. Michelle, your natural women's health advocates who blend the wisdom of ancient healing traditions and the science of functional medicine. Hello and welcome to another episode. Today I am so excited to introduce you to Natalie Frank Hayes. She is a photographer, educator, speaker, and founder of the Rising Tide Society. She's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in visual studies and a concentration in visual neuroscience and psychology of seeing. Cool, huh? Natalie also lives in San Francisco, California with her high school sweetheart and serves as the head of community for HoneyBook. So let's dive in. Welcome, Natalie. We are so excited to have you on the show today. Um, To start off, let's go ahead and just have you introduce yourself to our listeners so they can get to know you a little bit better. Well, thank you guys for having me on. I'm super honored. I am kind of a multi-passionate creative, if we want to start there. I had a career as a wedding photographer for eight years, and that led me to create a community known as the Rising Tide Society, where we gather creative entrepreneurs, freelancers, small business owners together in the mindset of community over competition. So we're meeting with this sort of vision to empower one another and raise the tide for all of us. Uh, rather than look at one another as competitors in the market. And this community that I run, you know, in the last three years that it's been, you know, out there and and growing now spans over 400 chapters around the world that meet every Mm. single month. And, you know, these groups, they're just extraordinary. They're led by volunteer creatives. So these creatives are stepping up to gather people in their hometowns. And we always gather around like a central concept or business initiative that we're talking about or educational resource that we want to share. And it's been uh, such a fun experience kind of transitioning from being a creative to building communities of creatives and doing that now, ironically enough, from the tech space out in San Francisco, because the community that I built was acquired by a startup out here. So it's been a journey. It's been a wild, wild run. So happy to provide insight at any, any piece of that. So awesome. Well, we will definitely, definitely link to how to get uh, in touch with one of those communities for anyone who's interested um, in our show notes for sure. So what was your key driving force to kind of become a woman entrepreneur, a ladypreneur, however you identify? (laughs) Yes. So I've been working since the time I was really little single mom. And from the moment I could get a worker's permit, I was doing everything from working at a local gym to shampooing hair in a hair salon. And um, I really fell in love with this idea of entrepreneurship actually at the hair salon while I was washing hair. Mm -hmm. I was watching um, these extraordinary women build client bases as hairstylists and experiment creatively. And they served almost in a lot of ways as therapists to their clients. You know, people would come through the door with their stress and their worries from their job and they would be met by a listening ear and someone who wanted to help them to feel better about themselves, right? Both, yes, from a hair perspective, but the part that actually enticed me was the emotional component, the companionship Mm -hmm. relationship between client and hairstylist. And I realized, I think, you know, at the young age of 15, that I could never sit in a cubicle and be satisfied with Mm -hmm. my life, that I was watching Mm -hmm. these women do something really profound, but in a very simple way. And I needed to find my, my way to do that. And so when a camera landed in my hands, I first found that sort of ladypreneur status in the photography space. And, you know, I I photographed weddings, as I, as I mentioned for eight years, but really, I think it, it came down to wanting to grow something with my own hands and really struggle and build and, you know, kind of that, that hunger that I can talk about sometimes on social media, but that hunger to create, uh, was very, very much a part of the early years of, of doing that. And so 
it really stems from that. It stems from kind of just stumbling into what was possible for my life outside of what I always thought I was supposed to be, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And I, I, I say that coming from a background of a family that is very scientific, very quantitative. I mean, my dad is a nuclear engineer. My mom is a nurse (laughs) practitioner. My grandfather was, you know, an aeronautical engineer for NASA. And I joke, I'm like, he's a rocket scientist. Like literally, Literally. he's a rocket scientist. (laughs) Sisters in medical school. So they they check all of the boxes of, you know, science careers. And um, I always dreamed of, of actually going into psychiatry and becoming a doctor. And oddly enough, I found my way of uh, supporting, listening. And my friends joke, they say I'm a therapist to the creative economy, but mm-hmm. kind of navigating that space of just being a, a safe space for people and a place where people can find fulfillment, you know, in understanding these these concepts of how business could be done differently to lead a life that is is more healthy, in my opinion, right? Um And I've been really grateful to be able to do that through entrepreneurship. I love it. So awesome. So awesome. Um, So as an entrepreneur, I'm sure, you know, things don't quite go as planned sometimes. So one of the things I love to ask is, you know, how do you stay motivated when you get those uh, bumps in the road? Yeah. So I think saying things don't go right sometimes is putting it really lightly. I mean, look, <laughs> if, if I'm being honest, um, I was equipped to be a photographer. I studied that for eight years. When I stepped into a new space, running communities, I was not equipped for that. This was new for me. And so I often describe it as every step felt more like a stumble, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it. Mm-hmm. I would I would take sort of three steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, two steps back and, and fail constantly. And motivation can be something that you know, is it's a finite resource in a way, um, you know, over seasons of our lives. And I, I think about it like an energy source that we sort of have to protect. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we fail, it can, it can be very easy to sort of either lose the motivation or become crippled by fear, mm. which is more my response, if I'm being honest. I think for me, whenever I fail, I become afraid that some how, you know, I'm going to either let somebody down or I, you know, made a fool of myself or whatever it is, insert insecurities here, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, the the truth of the matter is, I think failure is as much a part of entrepreneurship as breathing is a part of life. You go into something with big dreams and big goals. And if it all works out perfectly, um, that's, that's not really a story in which learning occurs. That's not a journey you grow and improve. And I think that as hard as it is and as painful as it is, um, motivation for me comes in improving and comes in seeing myself grow, you know, and looking back and actually saying, wow, you know, I really just screwed up and I totally messed up that initiative or I should have done this with that launch or, you know, I probably shouldn't have said X, Y, Z in that way. I really could have done a better job of that. But I wouldn't have even been aware of that mistake six months ago. I'm becoming more fine-tuned. Mm, See where yeah. I'm going with this? Oh, and, yeah. and identifying those places of improvement within myself and celebrating those little victories. I think it just it relights that fire, and it's all about perspective. It yeah. really yes. is. It's all about perspective. Yeah. You, the two things that you just mentioned, you know, flipping that idea around with failure and just really changing that mindset and having it having it not crush us, <laughs> which I think, it, you know, that that can for sure happen, but instead using it as a learning opportunity. And I just think that is like such I mean, that's like the key, right? That's like what keeps going and kind of what refuels our motivation and then on top of that what you said about celebrating small wins I think I don't know if it's because we're women or we're entrepreneurs or we're driven or what but we can so easily bypass that small aspect like ah that wasn't really good enough even though you accomplished something you just kind of like put it aside so really celebrating those small wins I think you've got you're on point there for sure (laughs) Mm -hmm. um so what book or person has inspired you the most? Well, how much time do we have? Oh, because my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I look, there are a lot of people. Um, I always like to try to pick, though, different people that maybe not not just anybody would recommend to you guys and, and your audience. So I, I'm going to hone in right now, getting a little bit nerdy. Uh, we joked before we hopped on just about how there are a bunch of nerds in the room. Um <laughs> <laughs> but I I am really a big fan of neuromarketing books. Uh, there's a great book by Roger Dooley called Brainfluence. It's one of my favorite books. And 
uh, he retweeted me once and I was like, can I put this on my resume? But you retweeted <laughs> me because that is how much I love this man and what he's doing, I think, for the marketing space and just bringing in sort of a very nerdy approach to business. And mm. so Brainfluence is one book that has heavily influenced me and including, you know, there's another book um, that's awesome called The Buying Brain. Um, which I also really love and just kind of get into this notion of understanding the human brain, understanding the needs that we all have as, you know, creatures and um, being able to create products and businesses and brands, I think that speak to those needs is, is a really fascinating concept. And I like to use it for good. So for me, it comes down to the idea of how do we market such that we can encourage people to be more philanthropic? How do we create mm -hmm. products that really serve the pain points that our audiences are feeling rather than just line our paychecks, right? How do we uh, understand, you know, what people are worried about, what they are struggling with, and then how do we align our communication strategies to ensure that they understand where our products or, you know, where our resources kind of meet meet those needs on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month basis. And so I, I find neuromarketing to be fascinating. I really think it's the future of a lot of marketing. And I think what's interesting too is that many people are kind of adopting some of those strategies and not even are fully aware of it. Uh, there's a cool trickle down that you start to see happening, whether it's with email subject lines or, you know, podcast titles or mm. different things when you see odd numbers and, you know, oh yeah, well, you know, odd, num odd numbers perform better. The brain recognizes them in, in a certain way. And so therefore having an odd number in your title of your blog post or your email subject line will capture attention at a greater rate, right? Like things so like that. Wild. that I so love cool. it. I love it. That's it's kind of nerdy. I mean, it's, is it kind of related to NLP? Maybe. Maybe like neuro linguistic pro programming. I don't I know. I mean, I'm, I'm not as familiar with NLP, but it's very much possibly in the same sort of uh, field, I have no doubt. I am definitely putting these on my Audible queue, mm -hmm. uh, ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, next question. What is the most terrifying, risky, or profound decision you've had to make in regards to your business? Okay, because for a second there, I was going to say, well, bungee jumping and getting a tattoo. <laughs> but <laughs> other than those two things, um, look, I think it's, it's for me, there were two, two, key, two key decisions, and they both happened at exactly the same time because they were wrapped together. Uh, and that was the decision to leave behind a photography business that I had been working for eight years to build and was bringing in almost a quarter of a million dollars in revenue a year by myself uh, to build community and to actually make less uh, doing what I do now than what I was doing. And that was one very risky and very terrifying decision. And wrapped up in that decision to go full time and lead Rising Tide Society was the decision to move from the East Coast where not only did I live, right, but where my husband and I actually met at 15, fell in love, got yeah. married, our entire families are based and move from basically DC to San Francisco, California, just about as far as you can possibly move in the United States if you're going to stay continental, right? <laughs> uh, both of those decisions wrapped up in one were sort of this, this massive risk. And it, for me, it was, you know, almost a, a test, a personal test of, you know, I talk a lot about taking risks and for me, in the past, it meant building a business. But this was a different type of risk. This was a risk of setting down something that I loved for something that I couldn't live without, right? Mm -hmm. um, trading something that was really good for me for something that potentially could be really great for, for me. And it was this very, very challenging time period. And I had a lot of people that gave me a lot of advice. And some of it was, yes, you have to do this. You know, you love building community. This is your passion. And this may not be what you do forever, but this season is is going to be crucial to learning and growing and stretching. And, you know, then I had other people that would say, how could you possibly set down this business? You've worked so hard to build it. This is your identity in the market. This is how people know you. And you're going to start over. You're going to start mm. from scratch at the bottom again, you know, and it was it was this defining moment, I think, of making a decision for myself and taking a road far less traveled. And I would go back in a heartbeat and I would do it again uh, a thousand times. What can you talk about what it looked like for you to make that decision? Like, I guess my question is, how did you get into a space where you were able to know what was true for you? Mm, gosh, that is such a good question. I think that it boils down to my purpose. Um, I 
feel very, very strongly that empowering women is something I was created to do. I was raised mm-hmm. by a strong woman. Um, my mom, you know, held my sister and I together when my dad left, and she was just such an instrumental part of my upbringing. And she sacrificed so much for me. And my grandmother, you know, who I spent a lot of time with as a child because my mom had to go back to school. You know, th- these women for me were an example of what you could be. And they were strong and they were fearless and they carved out their own paths. And, you know, I have always felt very, very much deep in my soul that that is exactly what I'm created to do. And Mm -hmm. for years, I I found that as a photographer, right? I would photograph weddings and I was able to walk alongside a a bride for the most part, although I had some amazing same-sex groom couples. But for the most part, I would walk alongside a, a bride and to be connected to her on a level that enabled me to speak into her life when things were stressful and support her and empower her and show her that she's, you know, strong and beautiful because that's how I saw her through the lens of my camera. That is, that was my, Mm -hmm. my path for a while. And for me, I think it came in this realization that, you know, I had for so long believed that the camera was my calling, that photography specifically was my calling. But what I was mistaking was the fact that the camera was my tool to achieve at that point, which was my calling, my purpose, and that the tool could change. But Mm. my purpose underneath all of it was to do one thing very, very well, and that was to empower women the way that women had empowered me. Mm. And I love that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, this is the truth. Like, I I saw building community, specifically with Rising Tide. We've got 80% female entrepreneurs in this community. I love my men, too. Man, I love the guys in the group. Um, You know, but I, I saw an avenue to make an impact in this way that I knew I couldn't make from a different position, a different career standpoint. And so I took that leap and um, I've just pursued it, you know, and whether, whether it was the best decision or the worst decision, I guess I'll, I'll look back in 20 years, but I can tell you right now that um, I've grown as a leader in ways that I, I, I never imagined growing and um, have just experienced some really extraordinary human beings along the way that, you know, I, I think have changed my perspective on the world and on life in, in really powerful, um, powerful ways. So I'm, I'm grateful that I, I did take the leap. But for me, it was just that idea of what is my purpose? Why am I on this earth? Look, time is so short. We don't have a lot of it. And I'm not going to waste a second playing it safe when maybe there's a way I can make a greater impact for other people, you know, doing something different. Totally. Mm. Totally. Ah, <laughs> so good. Um, so, okay, has your health ever be- ever come between you and your business? Oh, man. Where do I begin with this one, too? These are great <laughs> questions. Um, yes, look, the, the, the short answer is, you know, my health um, for a very long time was something that I privately struggled with. And it wasn't until about a year ago that I was able to feel comfortable enough and also need to publicly share about what had been going on. And so I'll, I'll kind of rewind it for you guys. You know, I started my own business when I was 18 and that's when I first got into photography. And when I was 22, I was really struggling with some just very common symptoms, but they were so connected that I just felt like something was up. Mm -hmm. Things like weight fluctuations. um, I stopped getting a period, which sounds funny, but my doctor said, oh, it's stress. And then for so many years, it just never came back. And Mm -hmm. finally I said, okay, this isn't normal. I'm not that stressed. I mean, I know I'm stressed, but not that stressed. And um, depression, anxiety, um, I'm trying to think like just just a lot of things that again, they're they're very common in the world, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about them now more, thank goodness, than before. Mm -hmm. But I never connected the dots that they could be related. And um, finally, I I went to a doctor's appointment and I said like, hey, you know, I'm getting married. I know I'm going to want to start a family. And a lot of these issues just seem to be kind of preventing me from feeling confident that that's going to be a reality for me. And I I just have this feeling, is there any way we can look into it? And I had a doctor that was super, super kind. And she um, said, yeah, you know what, let's run some blood work. Let's see what we get back. And when she ran the blood work, we found that I had incredibly high levels of prolactin and estrogen in my body mm. to the point where one of them she thought could have been a false reading. It was so high. And the second one um, was almost as high as if I was bre- a breastfeeding mother, right? My estrogen levels were at that point. And so she said, all right, Leah, something's not right. And all of the amount of testing that we went through later led us to a brain MRI and ultimately a diagnosis of a brain tumor. Mm. And 
you know, a tumor located in sort of a hormonal center of the body, an area responsible for everything from, you know, our, our hormonal fluctuations to our ability to retain water in the body to, um, you know, the list goes on and on. The pituitary, so, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it was, um, you know, sort of this kind of, uh, scary moment for me at 22, because I also recognized that, you know, I, it wasn't a small tumor either. And that was kind of tough. I mean, a lot of people have pituitary tumors. They're not an uncommon thing to have, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. but, um, at least not in the brain tumor world. Right. But, Mm -hmm. um, mine was a macro size. And so that was also of concern and explained some of the headaches and migraines that I had been dealing with. Mm -hmm. And this was when I was 22 and I, you know, was sort of at this at this point in my career too, where everything was exploding and growing and everything on the outside looking in was so perfect. And, you know, I, I really was terrified to share about what I was going through because I didn't want to lose clients. And I was really scared that if I was vulnerable, people would judge me or that somehow I would trade their respect for their pity, or perhaps Mm. that by being open, I would, you know, be judged. I think that was a huge fear. I I didn't want to be judged. I also was afraid, you know, everything is marketing. And I'm like, well, if I share it, they're going to think I'm marketing what I'm going through. If I, if I am honest about how hard this is, then it's going to be compared to someone else who has it a heck of a lot harder. And I, I, there was just so much fear wrapped up in me being vulnerable with it. And it wasn't until, you know, five years after diagnosis where I moved, as I mentioned, out here to San Francisco. I got one of the best neuro teams in the country at UCSF, and my doctors were very clear with me that surgery was the best choice for me Mm -hmm. Um, and just being able to have a better quality of life. And so with three weeks' notice, I found out I was going to have brain surgery to remove my tumor, and it would require me to be out of work for, you know, six to eight weeks and – that everything would have to come to a screeching halt. So when we talk about health getting between you and your business, I mean, look, there were (laughs) symptoms I dealt with along the way, but um, nothing really prepared me for understanding that everything was going to come to a screeching halt and that I would have Mm. to navigate that at a really peak point in my career. And, you know, that was just seven months ago. And um, I immediately, I think, just had some incredible life changing realizations, you know, and it's funny, I I describe it like this sometimes when you're trying to get something done, right? And let's say it's your inbox, we can use this as an analogy. Mm. You're trying to get your inbox down to zero. And you don't have a deadline on it. And somehow it just never seems to get done, right? Like it always has 10 emails (laughs) in there. And you're just satisfied with the 10 emails. but (laughs) But then suddenly you're going on vacation. And you know you're going on vacation and you're going to put that autoresponder up. And for whatever reason, you get the amount of emails answered in one hour that it would have taken you a whole week to accomplish because you have a deadline. (laughs) All right. Mm -hmm. This is how I felt when I realized I was having brain surgery. It was as if I felt like I had been kind of living my life um, for my business. And suddenly when I realized that wow, I'm about to go in for surgery and I could come out very different from this experience. I, there is a chance I don't come out Mm. of this. There is a chance that, um, my husband never gets a chance to, to experience this again, right. With us as a married couple in our twenties. And I would have traded anything in that moment for more time. I would have given back every dollar I had ever made. I would have skipped every late night working. I would have, you know, just, I I can't put it into words without getting really emotional because I think I just realized how short our lives really are because suddenly I felt this imaginary deadline on mine Mm -hmm. and it put everything into perspective for me. It made me really think hard about, you know, okay, what do I want to spend the next three weeks doing? What really matters to me next three weeks? That's what I've got before my surgery. And then I'm out for at least eight weeks. And there's a chance of all these other things that could happen. Right. But like, ideally here, I've got three weeks. What am I going to do? And what's really funny is I stopped working late and I started going home at five every day. I started making dinner with my husband. I started actually doing the parts of my business that I loved. The parts that involved connecting with people rather than doing busy work. Do you see where I'm going with this? It wasn't about trading the business for, you know, personal life. It was about finding ways to maximize the things that brought me joy and the things that, 
enabled me to leave a legacy behind because those are the things that only I could do, whether it was in my personal life, getting on the phone with my mom, getting on the phone with my sister, calling people, telling them that I loved them, or whether it was in my business, actually pouring back into the employees on my team, telling them what they've meant to me, telling them about the impact they've made on Rising Tide and the lives they're touching as a result and getting a chance to tell our leaders how much I appreciate the work they're doing in their communities. The rest of it, You know, the emails, the invoices, the, you know, biz dev meetings, even those somebody else could do. But it was those things that I felt really uniquely called to do that I that I poured back into. And that that was like, again, I'm still very much in this season. Um, I joke sometimes, Mm -hmm. oh, how was recovery? I'm like, well, recovery is going okay. (laughs) Um, You know, and like embracing (laughs) the reality that this is a lifelong change for me. Um, But I was very fortunate. You know, I. My surgery went a little longer than I thought it would, which definitely scared my mom and my my husband. But other than that, it was uneventful. I did come out with one complication called diabetes insipidus. It's mm-hmm. basically water diabetes. It happens in you know anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of cases with surgery in this area of the brain. But unfortunately, most of those cases go away. Mine didn't, so I still have it. Um, it just I like to describe it as I am the worst person to take on a road trip. <laughs> I thirsty all the time, and I've got to pee <laughs> once an hour. So if you're up for if you're pregnant, we can road trip together because I'll be your best friend, always making everyone stop. <laughs> but otherwise, I. I will annoy you to no end because I always have to pee nowadays. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's the reality of that situation. And I'm just grateful that I'm, I'm on the other side. Mm. Thank you so, so, so much for sharing. That's, I mean, the insight that you've gained at such a young age, you know, by going through this, I think is incredibly remarkable and things that you can take forward in your business like that, that, real focus on like joy and legacy like you were saying I think really puts things into perspective especially for those people who are kind of not doing the things that they love and kind of trudging around you know in day jobs and I don't know dealing with stuff right that we maybe shouldn't be dealing with I just think that yeah that's I mean that's big yeah, and it, it it really, oddly enough, it made me more passionate even about the work that I do on the tech side. So I mentioned that I work um, out here in San Francisco. I work for a company called HoneyBook, and it's, you know, it's funny, right? You you building a product, and what we do is we have. I should probably give some some parameters on what we do. So we we create a software that helps small business owners to run their business. So everything from contract invoices, workflow tools. Um, it's basically a CRM, and mm-hmm. there's so many great ones on the market, and I'm really proud of ours. And we you know, build this product to help creative entrepreneurs. And I had always loved being a part of, of building it. And the funniest part about this is I come back and suddenly it's like, no, this, I understand the need for this in a very different way. Okay. Right. To the point where it's like, mm. I, and I, and I've said this many times to different people, but whether it's HoneyBook or any competitor on the market, for me, it doesn't matter. I it really highly, highly emphasize now to every small business owner, whether we're the right fit or there's another fit that's better for you to find ways like with platforms like HoneyBook to streamline everything in your business so you can get back to actually doing what you love. Yes. And that means yeah. building these systems. That means finding ways to streamline. If there's a machine that can be doing something for you 24-7 in the background and you can use that mental capacity to focus on, you know, doing the creative work that you love or spending more time with the people that you care about, like I mentioned, it just, it gave me a different perspective on oh, the work yeah. that I do, you know, every single day in building this product. And so, um, It's just the biggest takeaway I think I had, which is our time is so finite and so precious. We don't realize it until oftentimes, unfortunately, it's too late or we're we're facing something like like I did. So, so, so true. Yeah, for sure. So now that you are on the other side, still in recovery or the recovery (laughs) process, um, do you have any self-care practices to help you recharge. I know it sounds like you have cultivated some amazing boundaries around what really matters in your life, which is huge. Do you have any specific non-negotiables that you want to share? Oh, absolutely. So I'm an introvert. I'm an INFP. And 
For me, self care looks a lot like introverting. Uh, it can look, it can look differently, but that's the truth. I think a lot of people might answer this question and say, you know, I spend time with other people, and what's funny is I do that every day for my job. My job is to build community, so I'm with people all the time. So for me, self care is actually oddly enough the opposite. It looks a lot like journaling, like writing. I'm working on a book right now, and that's become almost therapy for me. Just pouring out my thoughts, writing sort of my my day, what happened. Um, uh, what I'm processing through. It's just super therapeutic. I also am into doodling on my iPad. I call myself an iPad doodler because I am not a letterer. I'm not I'm not a great calligrapher, but I can doodle. And I've been doing that in the margins for years of all of my textbooks, which is why I never got refunds on any of them. But um, <laughs> the iPad has also sort of become a huge outlet for me. And I, I love that. Um, I, you know, I also, I love listening to podcasts. I, I think there's something really special about the work that you guys are doing. There's something really profound about being able to just put on some headphones and escape and just be uplifted by stories and advice. And so I enjoy that as well. Awesome. Well, I think Denise and I can definitely relate to the introverted activities. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, so what sort of entrepreneurial tricks or hacks have you discovered to keep you focused and productive during your busy schedule? Aside from mm-hmm. HoneyBook, of course. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's like dropping the plug there. HoneyBook helps you to know. <laughs> Yes, of course, HoneyBook. But also, uh, I'm a big Google Calendar girl. I love my Google Calendar. Every minute of every day is scheduled. And while to some people that sounds stressful, to me, it gives me immense freedom. I think of it as freedom within a framework. So I, you know, I will bucket in things like yoga. I'll actually schedule it on my Google Calendar. Time for dinner with my husband. Time to go to a movie. We're going camping this weekend. It's on my calendar. I use Google Calendar as a means to build out my my life and really force myself to make time for the things that matter. Yes. So, mm, I love that. Is, I do that too. <laughs> yeah. Super helpful. And I actually will say sometimes if it's not on the Google calendar, it's not going to happen. So totally. even little things, you know, prepping for something, I will go ahead and say, okay, it's probably going to take me five hours to prepare this talk for this event. And I will actually go through and schedule it. And it just keeps me focused. I also like block scheduling. That really helps my brain. Mm-hmm. I'm not great with a lot of creatives are like this, but I'm not great with jumping from one task to another, to another, to another. I get lost and depleted along the way. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'll, I'll carve out, for example, one full day that's social media focused. So if I have to work on social media projects, initiatives, strategies, it's a whole day of thinking about the same topic so that my brain is really honed in. Um, (laughs) I'll even go and say coffee. Right after my surgery, I couldn't drink coffee anymore. I hated the taste and the smell of it. And I think people were more concerned about that even than my surgery. They were like, what? Coffee? You can't, you can't drink coffee. This is part of your brand. You love coffee. I said, yeah, but it smells and tastes horrible to me now. Well, thankfully I can report that I am drinking coffee again, um, <laughs> which I'm not advocating y'all run out and go drink 10 cups of coffee to be focused. I think that there's moderation, but, um, it's the truth. I, you know, I'll drink a little coffee. I'll keep my block scheduling. Um, I also make time to get outside. I've really tried to take advantage of the fact that I live in a city where, you know, 365 days of the year, it's basically the exact same weather, except for June. (laughs) In June, it is like the Arctic tundra. Um, It is so cold in San Francisco in June. Don't let the summer uh, fool you. The marine layer comes in, guys, and it gets cold here. But Other than that, I try to get outside and I walk to work every day with my husband and my dog. And, you know, just Mm -hmm. something about that really just clears my mind. It sounds lovely. I love it. You mentioned podcasts. Do you have three of your favorites or three blogs that you can't imagine your day without? Ooh, let's do a little mix. Um, yes. So <laughs> I, I'm my my dear friend Jenna Kutcher has a great podcast called the Gold Digger Podcast, and love it. Uh, I'm yeah, a fan she's too. <laughs> she's great, man. I for example, she's an episode uh, about criticism that I was listening to this morning on my walk to work, and you know, I, there's just something really fantastic about her vulnerability. I think it's it's wonderful. So she's one that I really really love. Mm-hmm. Um, blogs. I look, I love, I mentioned Roger Dooley's book. He has a great, 
uh, neuromarketing blog that he contributes to. He either runs it or contributes to it. And I'm pretty sure we can we can make sure it's added to show notes, but it's For sure. along the lines of neuromarketing and, and just strategies of taking what we learn from different journal studies being done right now on the brain and how it can be used in business. And it's crazy things like even what side of a stage to, to talk to when you're trying to be emotional versus funny. I mean, I, there are Whoa. articles on there oh, wow. that are mind-blowingly cool. So I could not live without that. And then we'll also just keeping with the blog on the blog side of things, you know, I, I really like humans of New York. It's not just a blog. It's sort of like all over, right? There's a book, there's a, a blog, there's a Facebook page and Instagram, they all share different. Yeah. Of content. Yeah. yeah. But I love humans of New York. I think that stories really attract um, some of the best in us. I think empathy is sort of the weapon with which we need to combat a lot of the issues in the world. And I literally say empathy is a weapon because it just breaks down our walls as humans. And um, there's something about humans of New York that's really profound in the sense that you get to see a glimpse into these different lives. And yet someone may look different, have had a different upbringing, live in a different city, have a story that is nothing like yours, but yet in three sentences, he has some way of of actually capturing your heart and making you feel mm-hmm. as if you guys are kindred souls. And I think we need more of that. So for me, you know, Humans of New York has been just a, a really interesting inspiration source, I guess, that I, I couldn't live without. I love it. Breaking down those boundaries. <laughs> yep. Love it. Doing it. Um, all right. So if you had a little magic in your pocket, what is the one thing that you would change in the world? Oh, this is okay. I, this is a hard question <laughs> <laughs> because there are so many things I'd want to change. But um, if we're continuing, I guess, even with the empathy conversation, I think the one thing I would want to change um, in the world, oh gosh. You know, I'll say this. Um, when I when I was in college, I had never been fortunate enough to leave the United States. I mentioned growing up with a single mom. I didn't mm-hmm. I didn't have a lot of money growing up, and um, I worked because I had to. And so when I was finally able to leave the U.S. for the first time, I was really just taken aback by the beauty of other countries that I had had preconceived notions about and things that I had been told to be afraid of. Or, you know, for example, I flew to the Middle East twice this year by myself. um, And I've had the most extraordinary experiences with different cultures, just even in two of those trips, right? And I think that we're coming upon a time in our world where we are no longer separated by borders in the way that our parents were. We are able to see into the lives of other people and to see and experience what they are going through. We can use things, for example, you know, for the sake of this conversation, like the, the Syrian refugee crisis. And before we would hear things like, oh, you know, there is a war in another country that we've never att- been to ourselves. And it's really sad. But now we hear those things and we actually experience and see videos of children being pulled from the rubble, right, with blood coming down their faces and little kids screaming out for their parents that don't respond. And we experience the pain of other humans around the world in a way that we've never done before. And if I could change one thing, it would be for all of us as human beings to be more connected and empathetic and loving towards one another, regardless of where we are from or what we believe or who we love or what we look like or where we were raised. You know, because at the end of the day, what's really interesting about traveling is that I have met some of the most profound people and the most inspiring people, hardest working people. Um, and we have nothing in common except for the fact that our hearts beat and our lung- lungs expand. Mm-hmm. And yet that is more than enough. And um, I wish that that was more common. I wish people had the ability to really see into others' lives and see them for the souls, right? Not necessarily um, the different prejudices that many of us carry or the unconscious biases that many of us bring to the table that we're not even aware of. And just breaking down those barriers and opening up sort of that floodgate for empathy and love. And I think, again, there's a lot of bad about the internet, but man, if there is one good thing about the internet, it is that it's connecting us and breaking down a lot of borders and barriers. And these younger generations, they're able to communicate with kids and other adults around the world, right? And um, I'm just really hopeful that that magic kind of spreads and that love for one another continues to spread as a result. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. It's funny, you know, so many people or you hear so many people say like, oh, the world's getting so small or the world's so small. And it's not that the world's getting so small, but we're getting more connected, you know? Yep. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Do you have a current project or passion? Oh, <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm writing a book. I'm ah! working on a book right now, which I saying that I get giddy saying that, but <laughs> I, I, I am working on a book right now. It will likely be out either next spring or next fall. We're still kind of nailing that down. Um, and I'm hopefully going to be signing the official offer in the next week, which I'm really excited about more details. I can't say anything yet, but I, I don't want to jinx it, but um, <laughs> I've been working on this project for a long time. And so I'm really excited. And, um, it's basically my, I like to say it's my Instagram and book form. It's going to be inspiration and really just empowerment in this sort of mindset of abundance and community over competition as a way of life and how we can empower one another, support one another and, and do it while kind of raising the tide for everybody. And so uh, I'm really excited about it. I awesome. love it. Congratulations. Can't Thank wait to get you. my hands on that for sure. Oh, um, no. Is there anything that we didn't ask you that you would like to share with our audience? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> Big question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the biggest thing that I, I just want to share with, with the audience is just, you know, we talked a lot. We talked about a lot of things today, right? We talked about health. We talked about boundaries. We talked about empathy. Um the, the one thing we didn't really get to talk about that I think is so crucial is this idea of getting in person with people. Mm. I, I really am a champion for this. I think that, you know, from a neurological perspective, if you look at the brain, the ability for us to connect with others, there's something really powerful about sitting face to face, looking at one another in the eye and, and the mirror neurons that start firing as we speak about what we're going through and struggle with and our ability to really connect. And so I, I just want to challenge everybody with that and kind of leave everybody with that, you know. Uh, we live in a world that is all online and we say that we're more connected than ever before. But sometimes I think our technology disconnects us more than ever before. And there's this amazing opportunity for us to step beyond our screens and really sit with one another and talk to one another, connect and hear one another's stories. And I just would challenge everybody to to try it. You know, it, it doesn't have to be rising tide. We have meetups. Obviously, they're free. You're welcome. All of you guys are welcome. I joke. I'm like, I grew up I was the mean girl generation, that movie. And it was, you can't sit with us. And I'm like, we're the <laughs> We're like, come sit with us. Everyone can come sit with us. Um, but, you know, it could be Rising Tide. It could be a different community, a different group. Um, but get get out from behind the screen. Go and, and connect with people. It will so just trust me. Just trust me on it. It will change everything about your business and your life, even if you're an introvert, because I am an introvert and I still full and wholeheartedly believe in the power of getting together in person. Absolutely. Great challenge. I love it. Love it. So Natalie, how can our listeners find you? Yeah, so the best way is on Instagram. Uh, just go to at Natalie Frank on Instagram, or you can head over to my website, nataliefrank.com. And if you want to get plugged into the communities or check out HoneyBook, same deal, at Rising Tide Society or at HoneyBook on all social media platforms as well. Awesome. Thank you so, so, so very much. We loved chatting with you today and we look forward to your book and all your future projects. Thank you guys so much for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Holy smokes. I hope you fell in love with Natalie. She has such an amazing big heart and has had an incredible journey. We'll be linking all her social details in our show notes so you can check her out and get connected with a local Rising Tide chapter in your area. All right, next week we'll be diving into your questions around creating and cultivating boundaries. So be sure to join us. Until then, have a great rest of your week. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to Females and Fine Fettle from Wiped Out to Wealthy, a podcast to fit your lifestyle. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, rate, and review at femalesandfinefettle.com. If you have questions or topic ideas for upcoming episodes, we'd love to hear from you. Please be sure to tune in next week.